this lesson, I'm going to be drafting the camera animation and pencil test for Ave Moves and Kid of the Great's performance. I've done what I would like to consider a first year breakdown of the reference. I'm going to be fleshing out roughly 20 key poses on the mannequin rig I created in the last lesson. Very quick rough poses. Then I'll animate the camera around the mannequin. Next, I'll export two preview renders of my camera animation in JPEG format to Adobe Animate. One of just the background and the other of the character to guide the perspective sketching choices. I want to reiterate that the reason for this 2D, 3D visualization stage is because of how dynamic the shot cameras are going to be. Also because of the amount of VFX this shot is going to rely on. And also because of how much a lot of the animation is going to change from the reference. This pre-visualization stage is going to give me a very close visual of what the final result is going to look like. This will allow me to make any necessary changes before I start blocking out the animation on my 3D character rig. It also acts as another tier of research, which will only help the final shot look even better. Before I get started, I'm going to create cameras positioned exactly like the camera of the actual dance reference. This will help me to inspect the body dynamics of the shot from the perspective presented in the reference. If something looks wrong in the dynamic animated shot cam, I can always toggle the view back to the reference cameras to see if the motion is behaving as expected. So the first camera I'm going to set up is the one for Ava moves, and his is this. It's a front low angle. So I'm going to look for that same, about that same. First, I'm going to go view camera settings and turn on resolution gate. And then I'm going to look for a low angle that is about application. It's probably around here. Okay. And I'm going to go view, create camera from view. And I'm going to name it, call it Ave Moves Reference. I call it camera, Ave Moves Reference. And go back to my perspective cam so I can move to create Kid of the Greats reference cam. So that's also a low angle and it looks like we're looking at him from a low perspective too. So he's probably gonna be around like that. I should from around there or something in that vicinity. I might end up moving these cameras again. So I'm just gonna go view, create camera from view and call this one camera, Kid of the Great reference. Now I'm going to take my camera rig and duplicate it because this is going to be the main camera I'll be animating. This is my shot cam. I'm going to duplicate it. And as I mentioned in the previous lessons, I'm going to have to rename the camera. So I'm going to call it shot cam one and put it underscore after the name. I'll call this shot cam one master control. Okay, so now this camera has a unique name. Let me actually also name the locator underneath it. I'll just make this a habit. And these should be fine. I'll leave these alone. Next order of business is I'm going to tear these cameras off. So I'm going to pick the first one, which is Ava Moves camera. I will panels, tear off copy. And I'm going to stick it on the side here. to do it again with the Kid of the Greats camera. Panels, tear off copy. And that's also going to sit right there next to it. Yep. And then the last one is going to be our shot cam that I just created. Little panels, tear off copy. And that's also going to sit here. So I'll be toggling back and forth between these. I'm gonna double click to just hide it to the side when I don't need it. And I'm going to take the resolution gate off my perspective camera because I want as much screen space to be able to work. So I'm gonna go camera settings, no gate. Right, so this way these guys have their resolution gate and my main perspective camera does not. Before I get started blocking out the first pose, I want to mention that after the last lesson, I increased the size of the light truss. It was way too small. 
so I made it a lot larger, I scaled it all the way up. And now it should show up in view if I'm shooting at a very low angle from most locations on the stage. Okay, I'm gonna start with the first pose. So let me look for Avery Moves camera, hide the outliner for now. Take a look at the pose. I want just a quick rough. It's just a simple pose like that. Legs spread like this. A little bit of a bend. It doesn't really matter. I just want something that's in view that even remotely looks close to it. His hands by his side. Yeah, this is one very important part of it that I do want to change. I don't like the silhouette of um, the main reference because everything is, uh, the hands are touching the sides too closely. So here, I actually plan on doing this, having the hands a little bit more open, arched forward so his chest is a little bit forward. Another thing I wanted to do was make the ears like this, bent because when he starts sliding through the force through his shoulders, I want the ears to become upright. I do need to open the legs a little wider because she does have a tail and it's gonna to contribute to the silhouette greatly. I don't want it to, I don't want any muddy shapes. So her legs gonna to have to be a little bit more opened. I really like this mannequin idea. I'll probably use it again for future projects. It's really simple. I don't have to be intimidated by like a hardcore rig. All right, so the tail, I'm not quite sure if I'm gonna scale it up for this project, but I'll just put something over there. In the initial, in the start, I just want the tail to be relaxed and just following the hips. There's not gonna to be too much action on it, but as you go further here, I'm gonna start doing some things with the tail. This feels good. And now, what I plan on doing with the shot camera, is so I'm gonna grab it, let me move to the shot camera. So I'm gonna move it to location right here. And the shot camera, which I should also turn the resolution gate for, I'm gonna go camera settings, resolution gate. Another thing I like to do with these cameras is to go to the attribute editor. And down here, there is, should be a display properties and I want the uh, outskirts to be black. It's just, I like that better. It helps me to shot to feel more framed not part of the interface. All right, so for my shot cam, what I decided to do was have it at a medium shot and it's gonna be slowly rotating around the character. It's gonna be about here. Let me make sure I'm at frame zero. Let me increase the size of my timeline. I usually like a larger timeline reduce this. I'm only going to be dealing with about 210 frames. Let me just bring this down to about 210 just so I give myself enough space in the timeline. Okay, so we're going to start around here and this is where I need. I see I need to really improve what I'm going to be doing with the silhouette. I want the arms to be a little bit more open. So it's going to be almost completely different from I'm going to turn off geometry selection temporarily. So I'm selecting joints, only joints. So I'm going to, so hands are gonna be open like this. And actually I do want a more dynamic uh, camera angle that helps me push the depth of the shot. So I'm gonna go like this and make sure I'm at an angle like this. And that also means I might want to have this arm a lot more. Just use the Z depth of the shot better. So that this hand is a lot closer to the camera. Something like that. I might cheat with the real thing. Let's see if I can even push it towards the camera a bit more. Yeah, so I have a nice little dip. And then I have the other one, maybe go further back. 
This is really cheating. So about there. Check the low angle. Angle might work too. Maybe even more so. Okay. Yeah. And I might want to extend this a little farther. So what I plan to do is have I have a new layer that I added here. I'm going to start at a medium shot and I'm going to have the camera stay there and slowly be panning back. It should really be panning back this entire time. And then as soon as the shoulder pops like this, then I'm going to shoot to a full shot and mimic the cameras of Kid of the Greats. It's slowly moving. And then at around here, when he does this popping action, his torso hits a wall. The camera moves back. It's probably hard to see, but if you look at the background, you'll see there's like a zoom here as he pops. And then it's slowly drifting. So that's the only camera animation I'm gonna be doing for this part. When we get to the next section, tempo section, it's gonna go really crazy. So let me try to mimic this. So first I'm gonna I have the medium shot. Let me see how many how long I'm gonna need that. Roughly about two frames seventy-six. So Starting here, I'm going to set a key on this. I'm going to go to frame 76. And around 76, I'm going to rotate it. Let it move slowly. I have to change something in the settings to make sure all views are updating at the same time. So I'm going to go display. Uh, no, I think it's animation, time slider, and update views, update all of them. And I also think I like my tick sizes to be a little larger, my animation tick sizes. So I'm going to save and go to file, save preferences. Okay, so pretty much going to be moving like this. That might be a little bit too much movement. So I'm gonna go to the next, make sure I tone down my movement. Let me turn on auto key. I don't want it to ease in and ease out. I want it to be moving consistently. So I'm going to go into animation editor, graph editor. And I'm going to select these keys and make sure they're linear. So from here, I need to zoom out to a fairly good. I want to change two things here. I will first get the good angle that I want. Let me see how many frames that is. It's going to be from here. So from about 76, it's a little bit sooner than that, about five frames. I'm gonna start here and at around there, I want to be around this angle, I'm gonna be lower. And this is where I wanna key my Z. So I'm gonna take my translate Z, set a key here. Go to the next keyframe where I want it to be. Take my translate Z camera. And go back to get that low angle. Make sure I get a full shot of the character. Nothing too crazy this early. I want enough shot of the ground. because the element, there are gonna be elemental effects that I do want to read. I want them to register on screen. So I have enough shot of the ground. And I might need to be a lot farther back than I thought. Maybe about that distance. The character is not all the way in frame. come like this and zoom out like that. So over here, just doing a whole bunch of shaking, which I'm going to 
bring in with a materialized effect. She's going to materialize into view with this jittering. Let me show it to you. This is jittering. He's jittering, and then he starts. And during this whole jittering process, the character is going to materialize into view with Bifrost. I'm going to use some effects in Bifrost. Uh, some integration and disintegration effect. Let's materialize into view and then start this move. Shoulder pops and camera moves back. Okay, what I don't like, I feel like it zips too much. I don't think I have enough. I'm gonna select this and then I translate Z, which is the two places I set keys. And I'm gonna give it just a little bit more time. I'm gonna right click and do a play blast to see what it's looking like. So 30 FPS, that's not bad. It's gonna go slow like this as she materializes and then the camera zips like that. So it looks like I needed more than five frames to not get too much of a pop in the camera movement. And it's gonna continue drifting. I think I'm gonna start putting in the drift now. I'm going to lock and hide some of these groups because I'm selecting them by mistake. I'm just lock and hide them. I don't want to play with that either. I'm going to lock and hide it. So all I want to move is this uh, freeform mover, these split up transforms for sweetening, and then maybe the main camera, I might animate it. But right now I just want to focus on these and these to get what I want. So when it zooms out, I'm going to continue a slight rotation like this. Let me play blast this and see what it looks like. Yeah, that should be good. It starts off like that, zips out. I might do an anticipation on the camera first. Okay, looks like there's another issue with the curves because I'm choosing a flat uh, interpolation here it's slowing in and I don't want that so I do need a linear here well what I should do is break the tangents of the camera make this linear and then this will be flattened so that the movement has that. But I do want an antic. So when it's doing this, let me think of what axis I want. An anticipation in. It's definitely going to be the Z axis. No. It's the Z axis of this. Yeah, this is why I wanted to do the isolations. Because now I can just Instead of dealing with that messy freeform camera, I can just come over here to the Z axis and go like that. So I get a nice little anticipation and zip back. But let me see what the quality of it is. Okay, that's too much of an antic. So I'm gonna come down here, tone it down a bit. And then I do wanna follow through. Yeah, so this is why I did this, just so I can isolate. You see how messy this main freeform controller is going to be? So I just wanted to use it for general things. And then when I need to really sweeten things, I go down to the isolated transforms. That should be good. Let me see what the play blast feels like before I start blocking in the other poses. So I think I want, I do want an aggressive, I do want aggressive uh, antics and follow through it. So I just wanted to read a little bit more. It's not about that much. Let me try again. Yep, that feels good for now. When the action starts coming in, it'll probably make a little bit more sense. 
I'm going to pause the video and block out the other poses like I did the first one. Then I'll come back to show you what I have and to finish the camera animation. Okay, so this is what I have so far. All right, so I caught some of the poses. One of the important things I had to do was, as I said, as the force is traveling through the shoulder, I want the ears to stand up so they become more upright. So they were going out of frame. So I moved the camera in the Z with my trans Z. I moved it back so we have, we're farther away from the character. And I want to stress that these are supposed to be very quickly assembled poses. The only purpose that this mannequin is going to serve is to help me sketch better drawings and perspective so I can really get a proper visual of what I'm about to end up with in the end. So there is no attention being placed on anything other than just moving this around like a puppet, right? As long as the pose comes even remotely close to what the pose in the reference is, it's fine. So as you'll notice, the mannequin doesn't even have the capacity to capture a lot of these really granular movements, and I won't be trying to make it do that either. All right, so that's just one thing I, I really had to remind myself of because it's very tempting to go and try to actually create a correct pose or something that is of high quality and that is not the purpose of this mannequin. All right, so this is so far what I have. I'm gonna play Blast it. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video and the next time I come back, I'll have all the poses. There's about 20 of them. And then I'll finish the camera animation. So you'll have a full preview of what the first part of the sequence is going to look like. All right, I'm not gonna make you watch me move this mannequin around. It's just too much. It's gonna take too many hours of posing. But I'll explain, as I mentioned in the first lesson, this is more of an advanced course. So I'll do stuff and then I'll explain exactly what I've done. So I'm gonna pause the video. I'll come back with all the poses done and we'll continue. All right. I managed to get all of them in. As you can see, I changed the color of the mannequin just so she would stand out from the background. She was starting to fade into the background. So I just applied a simple fong shader set to red. Another thing I did was modify the script I was using to select the hierarchy of the mannequin's joint system. So before, all I was doing was running a select dash high. I dragged it onto my shelf, but I modified it a bit and now it will select the hip joint, it will do a select dash high to select all the child joints, and then it will set a keyframe. So it's like a key all for the mannequin. So I maintain the same principle when it comes to blocking out these poses, very simple, not intended to be finished poses, just limbs shooting out when they're supposed to, elbows shooting out when they're supposed to, shoulders being hiked up. These are some of the main body parts that are going to be exaggerated. I didn't really do too much of the tail. All that's going to come in the way of sketching and animate. I just wanted to add the tail because I wanted to be aware of it and the fact that it has to be animated. It has to contribute to the silhouette. I'm going to do a play blast to show you what it looks like and you'll see another thing I just did which I'm going to talk about before we start exporting this to animate. I'm going to right click, go to play blast. So then I'm going to go to the higher play blast quality, scale it up and make sure I select the correct window, go apply. So I managed to get in that zoom, you should see it right there. It's happening around here. Now what I did with that is, I was almost tempted to make it a camera move backwards, so I was gonna animate Z again. But for most cameras, when you see a zoom, it's more often than not a lens zoom and not an actual tracking back of the camera. So in order to get that zoom, I actually animated the focal length of the camera. The default was 35, which is typical for 3D scenes. And then I zoomed out, so I changed the focal length to 33 to get that zooming effect. That was also necessary because we're really low and any additional tracking backwards of the camera will kind of go into the floor. So 
it's good to be able to use this zoom. One thing I am going to do is when we transition to Tepo's performance, right at the part where I'm going to be doing that bulge distortion of the screen, I'm going to snap back to a 35 millimeter camera. It'll help enhance the effect. So I'll have the bulge distortion and then it'll kind of zoom back to the original position. So this is just another way to get back to my 35 millimeter camera. I want to mention that I had to go in and rename all these subgroups of this camera rig because I was getting an error message in my status bar here and it has something to do with clashing namespaces. So because this camera is duplicated from the main one here, I have to make sure that I rename every node under the camera. Otherwise, every time it's selected, a little error is going to show up because they're clashing namespaces. All right, now I'm ready to export the background and the mannequin to animate. This is a little test render. I had to see how things are looking. I wanted to make sure that the entire background, crowd included, was one tone, one value, so that I can draw comfortably with a black pen and the background can stay gray or white. I'm also going to reduce the opacity of the background anyway when I import it. That will also help if these crowd members are distracting the drawing process. So I'm going to stop this preview. And what I'm going to do is go to render layers and objective is to put the entire scene and the background characters onto one its own layer. So I'm going to add a layer called this proxy background. And I'm going to go right click, create a collection, rename it proxy BKG. And with those two groups selected, I'm going to go add and it should add those two to it, the scene and the crowd of spectators to that layer. So if I look at it now, it only shows them. And then I'm going to do a similar thing for her. I'm going to go Kiwa Mannequin. Let me spell it out so that when I add a collection, I can just call it Kiwa Man Q. So I'm going to add that. And now if I isolate this layer, it's just her on it. So I'm going to render at some really low specs, very low. I don't want this to take any time at all. And I'm looking at 200, roughly 210 frames. It's really up to 211, but I'll render to 215. I'm going to open the render settings. I'm going to crank all of these down to zero. I'm going to keep the, I'm going to go from zero to 215. And I just really want a simple format, maybe like a J, actually no, no a TIFF. I trust the TIFF to give me the transparency I need. And that should be it. This should render really quickly. If it doesn't, I'll come back and reduce the resolution. The resolution is 1080 to 1920 by 1080. I think it should render pretty fast. I'm also going to make sure that there are no light samples are as low as they can be. I don't want any samples to test the render. Okay, so those samples are down. Arnold samples are down to zero. And let's see what happens. I'll come back with the rendered result. Okay, here's the final rendered result of the background. I had to change some settings. This is her. Also looks good, not too grainy. But the original render settings that I had before I left were unacceptable. Zero samples for everything just produced this really grainy result. And there's no way I would have been able to draw on top of that comfortably. So I came in and added two samples to the camera AA and diffuse, and that's really all I needed because I cranked down all specularity. I want to make sure that there's no other shading effects because you don't need them. I don't need any specularity or reflection. So I went to all the materials and just stripped them of their reflectivity. So this is the end result and I'm going to import this into animate and I'll be back in animate. All right, so we're here in Adobe animate. I'm going to click full HD for a 1920 by 1080 canvas. And I'm going to go over here and go 50% so I can see the whole thing. Then I'm going to add a layer and call it background. I'm going to bring the background in first. Then 
I'm gonna go to file import to stage so I forgot that animate doesn't receive tiffs and after thinking about it I'm glad it didn't because tiffs are really large and it would have really slowed animate down so I had to go into Photoshop and run a batch process to convert the tiffs to simpler smaller formats for the background I chose JPG because it doesn't need a transparency let me import the JPG backgrounds or the JPEG backgrounds I'll go open and it sets the sequence I say yes bring in the sequence and yes it should line them on the timeline okay so it looks good and then I'm going to create another layer to bring in the Kiwa mannequin renders go file import to stage now for this this one it needs transparency so I batch processed it into a PNG in Photoshop I don't want to turn this uh, lesson or this course into a Photoshop batching course so if you want to know how to batch process images in Photoshop let me know I'll make a separate tutorial for that but keeping this in mind for the next stage when I start doing the next session of this dance sequence I'm gonna make sure to export the background out as JPG but I'll still export the character mannequin as a TIFF because I've always had a difficult time rendering PNGs out of Maya with transparency. The two formats I can trust with transparency are EXR and TIFF. So the character will be rendered as a TIFF and I'll batch it into a PNG for animate. So I'm going to select the first frame, go open. Yes, it's a sequence. So it's in, it took quite a while. Animate will take these image sequences, but it can get really hefty on the software. So ultimately, because of how long the sequence is, I might have to split these pencil tests into different files, which is not a problem. For now, I should be fine with dealing with anything from zero to up to a thousand frames at a time. I'll try not to go over that because things get really slow in animate but here it is and ready for drawing one thing i'm going to do is increase the size the space i have a timeline and i like to go right click and go properties and pick an, a half opacity for everything i'm going to do that for the background too i'll go right click properties click half opacity and this should be a wide enough canvas to draw and I'll be drawing on the first layer. So we're ready to draw. When it comes to sketching, I'm a scribbler, but I won't be doing a whole bunch of scribbling here. I'm shooting for bold gestural lines, preferably C's, S's and I's. I want silhouettes that are describing structures. I will also be using C's or arcs to denote shapes that are receding or progressing towards the camera on occasion. This pencil testing phase is really a note-taking process. I only want the lines that I need per drawing. So that means some drawings might need more lines to describe the changes that are happening from frame to frame and others will just be able to rely on simple silhouettes. If you notice, I've also created a layer up top that I used to break down the movement more and also to add notes about movements that I want to add that is not in the reference. So a whole bunch of information that describes what's happening and more information about what I want to put into the sequence. For that beginning shake, I did something really simple. Initially, I was about to sketch that shaking effect, but it's about 20 frames and I was going to have to sketch them on ones. That means one drawing per frame and I'm not going to do that. That's just silly. That just becomes a 2D animation project. It's not necessary. So I just drew one drawing put it on a separate layer, and then I went under modify, and I created a symbol, actually is it, yes, convert to symbol, and then I just set, uh, created a motion tween and just added a few keys, and then each key is being shifted with a transform tool over there, just to produce like a jittering effect, All right? I'm gonna come back and sketch over this when uh, I've put in enough keys and breakdowns, 
I'm going to come over and attempt to sketch what I expect from my dynamic simulation, my materializing effect. I'm showcasing a poster of the movie Beekeeper to show you what the materialized effect might end up looking like. So it's just the sort of an assembly of smaller particles that are sort of stitching together the character as the character jitters in the beginning. Definitely sure that it's going to end up changing a lot. It might end up having a fluid type feel or it might end up looking like paper particles, but I think I'm leaning more towards a fluid like feel, but here's an example of what it's probably going to look like. So about this bandana that you see me sketching over the character's face, the character is going to look like a bandit throughout the entire performance. She will start off with a bandana and shades covering up her face and end up with a balaclava or ski mask for the final section of the performance. As I mentioned before, the objective of this was to take the audience's attention away from her face so that her performance would be the focal point of the production. And so these right now are my key poses so far. I was able to put in the ears propping up as the shoulders pop. Right now it's just key poses. So I'll go to this pass, put in the key poses and move to breakdowns and then finish with whatever special effects I've described that are going to happen throughout this entire sequence. If you notice, that's my mannequin underneath. I locked the mannequin layer and the background layer that I brought in. I don't want to draw on them. But if you notice, I am not tracing over the mannequin. It's just guiding my choices, my perspective choices. So on occasion, after drawing a whole bunch, I'll just hide the mannequin and just inspect the actual drawing. Okay, let me do some sketching for you guys as we transition out of this medium shot so I can show you what I plan on doing with the ears and the tail and more changes to this movement. So in frame 85, which is where I'm going to put my next key, I'm going to click over here, add a blank keyframe, and I don't really need onion skinning now, and I'm going to add a keyframe here and write down what I think is happening. Shoulders hold down, hips stay put, tries to keep his head in the same, same space. His head put, I can just say put. Now there's something happening that I have to change. And the reason I have to change it is because it's the last pose of Ave moves and it transitions into Kida sequence. And Avi moves is lifting up his hand, his left hand. I don't want that because when we move to Kida, I want Kida's pose. That also means that I want to be able to angle the character at somewhat of a perspective and Avi moves are looking straight at him. So the sketch I'm about to do is going to reflect these changes. So started I'm going to grab my pen, I'm looking at it, at the character from the bottom. I'm to make sure I have and I'm going to change this to be more of a sort of bow-legged type feel to the leg and also well when I say bow-legged I just mean I like this shape this design it's gonna look cooler but it might be too much for what is, is what is required. So I'm gonna be careful about how much I push it because after the toe spin effect, there is a heel spin. So by toe spin, I mean the toes stay in place. And I'm only describing that as that because on my rig, that's what I call that type of behavior. When the character's heel spin as the toe stays in place or the toe is the pivot, and then the heel spin is when the character's heel stay in place as the toe rotates out. So I'm gonna finish this toe spin. This is a simple silhouette. I wanna make sure I capture the gesture that's like this caved in gesture of the torso and his shoulders are coming down 
And there's me scribbling again. Like I said, I want to try to avoid the scribbling uh, and just be very intentional with what I'm expecting from uh, these limbs. Make sure the head is reflective of what Kidda is Kidda's head is going to be doing. So it's looking straight. It's not looking straight, but it's sort of looking perspective over there. And okay, keep leave the hand alone. I get that it's in the back. In this bandit mask that I spoke about previously. I think it's gonna be in there. I want to start visualizing what I'm going to do with it if it's going to be trying to arch itself to contour with a body or if it's gonna be doing something completely different. So I just wanna start putting it in and now. Um, as I mentioned before too, the headphones are gonna be on and the glasses are gonna be on, but for now I'm gonna leave those out. I might end up, if they're gonna do something like drag aggressively, if I need it for that drawing, I'll sketch it in that drawing. All right, let me just put the tail somewhere for now. I was hoping that was gonna stay in between the legs and be sort of reacting to the hips. So for now, I'm gonna put it there. I did wanna scale the tail up a lot more, but I'll see, after I've drawn a few of them, one, for the tail, I noticed in the last breakdance animation I did, I had to change it completely. I might have to change it completely when it gets to blocking phase or when it gets to the splining phase, but it's good to start visualizing now about what it's going to be doing. So, it looks like this drawing ended up on the wrong layer. That's the notes layer. I'm going to add a keyframe there. So really, over here, a little toe spin. Let me hide that and see what it's looking at. Character's hips are moving now. So I think I will be dragging this tail, at least from the root. So I should be getting an S type of shape because I'm dragging from the root. I'm gonna draw through the forms, but perhaps exaggerate it a bit. And again, this might change. I think it's gonna be between the legs, so I'm gonna keep it there. I wanted to keep the tail really settled at the beginning because it's gonna get aggressive but before it gets there. I just wanna make sure that uh, we have a nice settled feel. What I'm actually gonna do is put the tail, I'm call it pencil test uh, name. Okay, this is some naming convention. I have to make sure I use underscores. I'm gonna add a new layer and call this pencil test tail. And I'm gonna insert a black keyframe here and make sure that I'm drawing my tail on there. Erase it from this layer. I just want to keep my tail on there. I realize I might have made a mistake with the gesture of the body I'm looking for. The gesture is, quite frankly, it's the other way around. It's this. reverse C here just to show that the rib cage is 
looking at it from somewhat of the bottom view. And these are just lines and call notes to guide the decision making later. It just occurred to me another thing I want to do is just paint this a different color. It just helps the visualization better. That's drawing on frame 83. Note taking for frame 83. Another thing I have to take into consideration is that she has a jacket on and it's gonna impact the silhouette. Since I'm not drawing it here, I do really have to start thinking about making sure the hands are a lot more uh, away from the torso to allow us to get some, to give us room for the jacket the puffy part of the jacket. So that's another thing I have to constantly think about. All right, so this is what I'm gonna be doing. I'm going to pause the video, come back and do a little bit more sketching when I'm towards the end and I can explain the majority of what I've done. And I'll go through and explain a lot of the drawings and then we'll close the lesson. So here's the finished sketch playing side by side with the reference. I added a lot of breakdown drawings just to get things to read better. There are two popping actions that I was not able to capture in this pencil test, but that need, but that I need to pay attention to when it comes time to block and spline the animation. The first one is these two hiccuping actions that he does there. The first one is there, it's like this, he hits a wall and then reverses, he changes direction almost immediately and it reads as this clicking action and he also does it here. First eases into the pose and then he hits a wall and then he slides out. So that was a little bit more difficult to capture but I've kept, I've kept track of where they are and I'll make sure I get them. Initially, I'd planned to have a lot of elemental effects accenting his actions or some of them motivated by major movements that he's making, but I realized that it's really going to distract from the action. So I'm going to stick with this initial materializing effect that is sort of motivated by these spiraling elementals. And then I'm gonna use this one that charts the force through his arms and upper torso. And then I'm gonna stop and let the action play. And the only other place there's another elemental action is there, where his elbow pokes out and he kicks. I'll have some elementals shooting out. And another thing I didn't mention was how Kidder the Great's performance transitions into Tepo's performance, which I'll be doing in the next lesson. So I have to transition from Kidder's kick into the pose that we start with at Tepo. Another thing I did was put a fill layer underneath. So I changed, I took the opacity of the background. It was 50%. I brought it back since I want to see how the background elements are impacting the final drawing. But in order to make sure that the drawing stands out, I put a fill layer here. So it's just like a shaded white so that it takes the background out. These elementals, um, I use a trick to do them. I first drew a whole bunch of spiraling lines. So all these spiraling lines are on the character. And then I animate along the path. All right, so it's, it's how I'm going to represent all these elemental effects in this 2D drawing. When I get to 3D, I'll have a whole bunch of better tools to make it look rich. But right now, it's just important to show that there's something, some sort of VFX happening there and just so that I have an idea of how much I'm going to need to put in. Another thing I managed to get in was a tail, as you can see. I tried to keep it relatively relaxed 
it's not going to be too busy here at all. When we transition to Tepo's performance, it's really going to be flying. So I just want a nice initial settled movement that just echoes the behavior of the hips. Have some overlapping, some delayed reactions as the character lowers their center of gravity. It's good to be able to see it in here. I think this is a, a relatively simple, simpler phase to block out. I think that the real complicated stuff is coming next. So that's it for this lesson. That's Avi Moves and Kid of the Greats performance blocked out. In the next lesson, I will be doing the same thing for Tepo's performance. His is twice as long and I'll stitch it to this one and see how it transitions. Tepo's performance is a lot more aggressive and the camera animation is really going to be very dynamic there, very different from the reference. So that one is going to be the more challenging one that will benefit from this pencil testing process.